Okay, so uh, let me get the right thing here. Okay. Um, the purpose of this meeting is to basically just talk about um, the, the most common reasons for making errors on a test. So we're not going specifically through the anatomy tonight or um, looking at specific questions as to why you got that question wrong, but we're looking more at generalities because, you know, let's face it, you've done the first two units. Um, the majority of questions that you're going to be seeing from now on aren't going to be related to the first two units. They're going to be the third unit. So specifically knowing why you messed up that sciatic nerve question um, is not necessarily going to be as helpful when we look at uh, unit three. Hopefully you had a chance to take a look at that form that I distributed to everybody and had a chance to fill in some of the information from that form. And um, if you are able to do that, then this session will hopefully be of assistance to you. So you probably remember this form and generally speaking, this is based on educational research that shows the most common reasons that individuals make errors. So some extensive work was done, taking a look at individuals and basically um, asking them when they reflected on certain questions, why they thought they got it wrong. And after taking a look at all the various responses, what they were able to do was group them into um, what they found were common themes. And so they came up with um, four general overall reasons or categories, and then they were able to come up with subcategories that were in those. So at this point, you've hopefully had a chance to go through your exam questions and use that chart and sort of identify the reasons that you got certain questions wrong. So the question becomes now, what do we do with that information? Um, the big thing now is to take a look for trends. So hopefully you got something that looks somewhat like this, where you're able to give a little bit of um, uh, a description of what the question was about so that it can refresh your memory to it. And then you're able to put a box down, in this case, the individual did a double X sign saying, you know, that that was the reason that they got this wrong. As you go through the chart, you might have um, a few things like one question might have been studied, but you just couldn't remember it. But hopefully what's really started to happen at this point is you've identified one or two, possibly three of these content areas where you just kept putting box after box, which allows you to now focus in on that as one of the principal things that's preventing you from being able to get the question correct. So what this session is going to do is we're gonna look at each one of these sections and give some general strategies as to how to avoid making those sorts of mistakes moving forward. So to start off, we're gonna look at content issues. And the first one is that you didn't study or that you didn't study enough. Um, and I put the enough in parentheses because I think generally speaking for the majority of individuals in this class, it isn't that you aren't working hard enough. This is an incredibly grueling class and I know that everyone's giving it their all. Um, but this is something to also keep in mind for other courses that you're taking because I know that as you move through, you spend some time focus on certain classes that are known to be more difficult, which necessarily means you don't put enough focus on other classes. And then when you look at your performance in those classes, you can honestly say, okay, I didn't give that class enough attention. I didn't take it serious enough. Hopefully that's not the case with the summer class, but you know, this is something where you have to reflect and be honest with yourself. And if you can look back and say, you know what? I did kind of slack a bit. And um, the point of the session is not for people to come up and stand up and say, you know what, I'm guilty of this, no show of hands, no nothing like that. All of this is about self-reflection and being honest with yourself. And when you take a look at this and have this internal dialogue, um, if you are in a situation where you say, you know what, I didn't give it my all, I didn't put as much effort in as I uh, really should have, then, um, that's going to allow you 
to say, okay, moving forward for the next test, um, I'm gonna need to put more time in. Um, with the didn't study enough though, there are some strategies that can be used. And this would be the situation that you're working around the clock, you're busting your hump, trying to do well in this class, but you get to the test and you're getting questions wrong because you just didn't have a chance to look at that material possibly, or look at it in enough detail. So some of the big reasons, first of all, underestimating the level of difficulty and the amount of studying required. So this might be a um, situation where you thought you were putting in the appropriate amount of work and you felt very confident going into the exam. And then when you saw the level of detail in the uh, questions, you sort of realized, okay, I wasn't doing the sufficient amount of work needed uh, to be prepared. And hopefully that is very common after the first exam. <laughs> Um, after the second exam, you do have a new feel, and this is going to happen with any class, is you don't quite know what to expect until you get to that uh, examination. So hopefully that will help you for the third exam. Uh, another good strategy here is to try and study well in advance, and then as with the other exams, I'm going to be releasing a practice test. And based on your performance in the practice test, I would recommend that you treat it exactly like a test. Don't go into your notes trying to figure out the correct answer. Just go in as you would go in to the examination itself, answer to the best of your ability, look at your score at the end, and that's gonna give you a good sense of whether you are prepared or not, because there's a pretty strong correlation between performance on the practice test and performance on the overall test. So if you're not doing well on the practice test, that tells you that you need to put more work in on certain areas. Um, left it too late sort of situation. So this doesn't really apply as much to this class, but it is something that we'll talk about moving forward. And we use the expression, if you've ever heard it, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Uh, the idea here, and um, we are all guilty of doing this when we have multiple classes that draw our attention, is that um, we, let's say, are taking anatomy and biochemistry at the same time. And so you have a big anatomy test coming up. And so you completely drop biochemistry and you do nothing but study anatomy for the four days leading up to the exam. Hopefully that means you do pretty well on the exam, but that sorts of creates a binge and purge situation where right after the exam, you've kind of forgotten everything uh, because you were cramming it in. And now you're four days behind in biochemistry. You have a test next week so now you're playing catch up, trying to review all the stuff that you ignored, as well as study for that exam. Um, consistency is absolutely critical to long-term retention, as well as to performing well to the test, uh, um, to the um, various examinations going to take. So this is a recommended chart based on what the research shows is an effective strategy for learning. And there's a little link here. <laughs> that you can follow, it's, it's in my YouTube channel. It's just talking about the theory of learning and cognitive retention that you can take a look at. And it goes into more detail and you see this chart uh, posted in that as well. But essentially what you would do on Monday is you have your Monday classes. That evening, you're actually not gonna study the material for Monday. You're going to look, just general review of the stuff from the previous week, as well as do any pre-reading that you might need to do for your class on Tuesday. Tuesday's class, you get out of class, and what you would actually do here is review for Monday. What the research shows is that if you wait about 36 to 48 hours, you have this sort of golden window, that if you review the material 36 to 48 hours after you were first presented with it, it's escaped your memory enough that you have to work a bit to recall what was being talked about, but it's still fresh enough in your mind that you make these um, cognitive um, associations. And one of the common ways that this happens, and I do this all the time, is I'll be looking over something and I can vividly remember the professor talking about it and how I was sitting and even the movements of other people around me. If someone dropped a pen, I kind of, well, yeah, that was the moment that that person dropped a pen. So you have these vivid sort of memories because it's still fairly fresh in your mind. If you revisit it at this point in time, um, you have a better chance of it becoming 
ingrained into long-term memory because you're revisiting it enough that your brain is sort of being told, this is something kind of important. You need to pay attention to this. And if that area of your brain lights up multiple times over the next couple of days, it becomes a long-term memory. So you would do the review for Monday's class, prep for Wednesday's class. You would then on Wednesday, review Tuesday's classes after class on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, try to review stuff from Monday because it's been that 36 hour window again, but also stuff from Wednesday on the previous day. Friday, now you're gonna look at stuff from Tuesday because it's been that uh, 36 hours since you've looked at it, as well as Thursday's material. And then moving into the weekend, general review when you have time, and then also make sure you're booking in plenty of time for a little bit of downtime. Because if you try to go the entire way through um, without giving yourself any break whatsoever, uh, you're gonna burn out and you're not gonna be able to remember anything and you're going to be fatigued and that's also going to have a negative effect on the exam. So you have to build in that downtime. Friday evenings, ironic, because I'm meeting with you on a Friday evening when you should be sort of relaxing, um, but you know, that's just how the schedule is right now. And then sometime on Saturday and either Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon, work that um, downtime in. So your weekends are general review, also prep for Monday, and then you start the same thing over again. So in applying it to what we are doing in anatomy, whatever we study on Monday, you wanna to return to it the following night. I know that you have to do a lot of preparation for the class coming ahead, but if you could take even 20 minutes to review your notes, from Monday's class on that Tuesday, then you're gonna have a much better chance that by the time the exam rolls around, these, will, these ideas and these concepts and this understanding will still be fresh in your mind. And typically people that follow the strategy will say that they got to that focused time when they needed to study for the exam and they didn't feel they needed to work as hard because as they started going through their notes, everything already felt fresh in their mind and they had a, a firm grasp on it, they felt. So they already felt very well prepared. Um, general feelings of being overwhelmed. So just the idea that there's not enough hours in the day. And I'm sure that all of you are feeling that way right now. Um, that's sort of the nature of the class. Um, it's the way that it's been set up. I, it was you know, what I adopted when I uh, came to UB. Uh, that's the way that they need it taught, and there's really no way around the intensity of the class when you consider the amount of material that you're expected to learn. Um, the big thing here is looking at your productivity, and this is um, something where you need to reflect on how you're working. Um, and once again, this is a chance for you to self-reflect um, and be honest with yourself, but I can tell you from years of experience in teaching, <laughs> that I will get a number of students that will come and talk to me and say, I, I don't know where I went wrong. I was studying this five hours last night. I spent studying the material. And um, uh, particularly when I was at South Dakota, my office was right across from a series of study rooms. I would see students there all the time in study groups. And it was quite common I would walk by and see a Facebook page open or students would even be broadcasting sports on the TV associated with each room. So what you need to do in this situation is kind of keep a track of things and even a working diary. And as you're studying, look at the number of times that you just disengage and look at Facebook or get an instant message or a group me chat come through. And the second you see it, you open it Yes, you're spending five hours studying, but how much of that time are you really stu spending studying? So um, while you're actually in that dedicated study time, turn off all notifications, email, social media, anything that might pop in and take your attention away from what you're actually focused on. <coughs> turn all that media off. Um, put your computer into airplane mode if you've got laptop sort of situation so that you only have the resources that you should be studying from. 
If you need to go to the internet, turn it back on, but only go and look at the material you need for that study. One of the big things that's recommended here is something called a Pomodoro technique. And the name comes, weirdly enough, from a Pomodoro timer, which is this little uh, tomato, a Pomodoro uh, tomato. The guy that invented it used this for study purposes. So this is where the name came from. You can write this out and look into it um, further yourself um, as to how it works and how it would work for you. But the idea, the, the long and the short of it, is you set up a timer for yourself, typically 20 to 25 minutes. You start the timer and for that 20 to 25 minutes, all you are doing is studying for the material that you plan to study for in that session. As soon as the 20 or 25 minutes are up, the timer goes off. And even if you are mid sentence, even if you are only a few sentences away from finishing the topic, it doesn't matter what you're doing. As soon as that timer goes off, you push away from the desk, you, you get up and you walk out of the room and you disengage from the topic entirely. Take your phone with you, look at social media, look at emails, um, any sort of chat messages, um, get a drink of water, um, just enjoy looking out a window. Anything that doesn't have you thinking because that's the time that you want to, five for five minutes, disengage from the material altogether. After that five minutes, you come back to your desk and you start on a new task. It may be a continuation of the task. So planning ahead is key. So you know that you're gonna have these little study units of 25 minutes each. And when you're planning it out, looking at the evening ahead, be realistic to yourself and say, how many of these study units can I put in? Maybe it's two, four, maybe you're gonna put in the three solid hours and have exactly six of these units in place. For each of those units, the um, day before or the, the morning of, plan out exactly what you're going to do to it during each of them. And you may at first be a little bit overly optimistic as to what you can get through. You soon will soon learn that you can't be, but stick to whatever schedule you um, created before. So if you said for 25 minutes, you were going to look at this content matter, that's all you're looking for. If you don't get through it all, don't worry about it. Just push it away and recognize that the next day you can make another study unit, another Pomodoro uh, based on that. The idea here is you get yourself trained to when you sit down to look at the material, that's all you do. You ignore everything else. You phase everything else out and you train yourself to be focused on that one piece of content in the moment. We like to think that we are the multitasking generation, that we can have five things going on at a time and be able to handle them all. The truth is the research shows that does not work. If you have multiple things going and one pulls your attention away, you are not focused enough to really get the learning benefits than if you completely isolated yourself and only looked at the one topic. It's difficult at first and it kind of seems counterintuitive um, but once you get used to it, uh, you should find that it's a much more effective study strategy. So this is something, write down Pomodoro technique and look at it into it a little bit further as to how it's exactly set up. Um, the other thing with this is that you need to recognize that you're human and you're only gonna be able to do so much. You are only going to be able to perform so well and you need to be okay with that. So I see students all the time that are feeling physically and emotionally overwhelmed, um, are beside themselves, are anxious, are panicked, are depressed. And a lot of that is they look at their test performance and they consider that a reflection of themselves. And it becomes very easy at that point to self blame and shame yourself. And that's only going to lead to anxiety and depression. So being honest, regardless of how you do on an exam, if you can reflect back and know that you did everything possible to plan for that exam, even if it's not the mark you were looking for, you can at least say to yourself, hey, I did my best. 
and be able to move forward. And in cases where you can, you know, reflect on it and say, all right, I could have done better here. I'm going to put this in place for next time. So rather than beating yourself up over, I should have done this before that's done. That's in the past. That's something you should do for the next test and always be the focus. I need to improve. This is what I need to do to improve. And if you're taking that approach, then you're probably going to have a better self image. You're going to be uh, mentally healthier and happier knowing you're doing your best and you're always trying to make improvements. So always focus on the next test coming up and what you can do to be better for that test. The other content issue was level of uh, detail. You probably noticed this with the first test that with um, especially this, this um, course, it's taught in a very unique way and you're being tested and asked to think about things in a way that you've never had to think about before. And so it's um, very important after the first couple of tests to look at the level of detail that's uh, necessary for it and to use that to prepare for upcoming tests. So the best thing that you can do here is to, um, while you're looking at new material, think about the previous test and recognize that each instructor, and there is an advantage in that I'm the solitary person that's always writing the exam questions. So now you see my style. That style is not gonna really change for unit three. So you have an idea of how I phrase questions and what I tend to focus on. As you're going through the new material and you see something and you'll think, I know Dr. Ingalls now. I'm willing to bet Ingalls is gonna ask a question on this. And then you can generate your own questions in the form of these Anki cards so that as you're reviewing them, um, you're constantly testing yourself. This is a concept known as um, active recall and uh, one of the best approaches to learning. Um, they've actually done research on this as well, and that other video on YouTube covers it a bit more extensively, but the bottom line is they found the most, the, the favorite studying strategy listed by university students is reviewing notes, and they have found that this is one of the least effective means of studying. Taking notes is effective, but as strange as this sounds, <coughs> Once you've written out those notes, best thing you could do is not look at them again. The sheer act of making the notes, even though you never look at them again, that's where the learning comes from. Reviewing the notes is a passive process. It is not gonna help you make those long-term connections. Creating these flashcards tends to be much more effective for long-term retention of details. Um, another issue here, uh, yeah, so I just uh, mentioned about the um, Anki deck there. Um, thank you for that, Yuka. Absolutely. And, you know, if anyone uh, does have problems uh, finding Anki at this stage, uh, just send me an email. Um, send the TAs an email, too. They're much more tech savvy than I am, so they will certainly be able to help you out. Remembered it wrong. So this can sometimes happen where you think you had an understanding of it and I'll get students all the time. It's like, but I thought that this was a situation and I'll say, well, no, that it's actually this way. And they're like, oh, okay. I completely messed that up. If you find yourself doing that where you study it and you think you have a good grasp and then you do these test questions and realize that your interpretation is off from what it's supposed to be, one of the best effective strategies, once again, is working with these Anki cards and doing self-quizzing, um, but also working in study groups or with instructors and with TAs. And being proactive in that when concepts are discussed that you're actually taking the time and verbalizing, my interpretation of things is that this is how it works. <clears throat> and when you say it out loud, number one, when you're doing this a lot of the time, um, you, you get to a point where you just start stumbling on your words and you realize, okay, I, I don't understand this as um, well as I thought I did, and that goes into level of detail. But after you finish explaining something out loud, um, one of the TAs or an instructor will be able to say, actually, um, we need to make some adjustments to your understanding of things 
uh, because there's, there's a little bit of misinterpretation here. And then they can explain something to you, at which point you can say, okay, so based on what you just said, this is now how I understand it. <clears throat> and you have this back and forth going until you get to a point where you're explaining something and everyone in the room is nodding. Yes, that's it. You've nailed it on the, the nail on the head. You've hit the nail on the head. Um, so that comes with time and practice. But again, being able to verbalize, say things out loud, number one, you'll see if it makes sense to you. And number two, if you're working in groups and people are looking at you with confused looks, then you know that maybe you don't understand it quite as well and you need to review the notes. Um, and this is a time where it is good to go back to the notes, generally not. You, you generally don't review the notes unless there's a concept that you are just really struggling and understanding. And then going back to basics in that case and looking at the notes to clarify it in your head, that's when the notes come in handy. Once you think you have a firm grasp of it, that's when you leave the notes to the side. Study but couldn't remember it. So this is where you need to prioritize your studying. Some people will take the um, approach that, okay, I'm gonna start on this day, and I'm gonna study everything from that day, and then study everything from this day, study everything from that day. But the truth is, if you really reflect on things, there are certain days where you just come through feeling comfortable. It's like, yeah, okay, that, that stuff was pretty straightforward to me. And then there's other days where you're just, okay, that just completely went over my head. Those are the questions that you're probably gonna struggle on most. So when you are actually making the Pomodoros, if you use that technique, or just budgeting out all of your study time, however you decide to approach it, have confidence in yourself that if there was an easier content matter, that you don't need to look at it again if you think that you have a firm grasp. Focus your attention on the stuff that's giving you the most difficulty um, so that you can get to a point where you can master the, that material. Applications, so there's a lot of this in this class, studied it and remembered it, but I couldn't apply it. And so what we're trying to do in this class is get you to take that next step in the learning. So anytime you're going through the basic notes, you should always be thinking, okay, what would happen if there was damage to the structure? What would happen if this wasn't working properly? Um, what would be the presentation pattern? And make notes of this for yourself so that you'll be better able to recognize when you have a question a patient presents with such and such, you will start being, becoming better at making those connections based on the fact that you're making these interpretations and trying to apply it from the very beginning. Test taking still. So um, this is a big one for a lot of people is just how you actually approach the test. And there is an art form to test taking. Um, everyone has different approaches, but there are some approaches that seem to be universally better than others, even though it kind of goes against individuals' intuitions. First one is misread or misunderstood. This happens if you try to work your way through a question too quickly. Um, the recommended approach for every question is to read your entire way through the question stem until you get to the actual question. Uh, an alternative of that is people will actually read the last sentence in the stem first so that before they go through the rest of the material, they already have a good sense of what they're going to be asked. And then when they read through the stem of the question, they're trying to focus on every point. So you go nice and slow when you read it the second time and focus on the big pieces of information. If you have your scratch paper in front of you with each sentence, Generally speaking, each sentence is there for a reason and gives you another piece of the puzzle. So try and think about the big points and writing them down helps you to conceptualize these points. Um, after you finish reading through the stem and you feel confident you know what it's asking, you will hopefully be at a point where it's, the, the correct answer is already coming up. So when we stuff about, see you know, things about um, an injury at the wrist, the individual has an ape hand deformity, you know, at that point, you should be thinking, oh, this sounds like median nerve. So you should have an answer in your head before you even read the option list or what we call the distractor list. Once you see it, click on it. Because you thought that was the correct answer, having read through the stem, 
that's an option that's there, it's likely that that means that it's the correct uh, answer. Uh, especially I hope that you notice with my course, my questions are challenging, but they're not designed to be tricky. They are designed to, it, they, they are designed in such a way that if you're reading through it and an answer comes to you, that really should be the correct answer. I'm not trying to trip you up. I do that in the FALs when it doesn't count, but that's when it's um, good to really start thinking about those things for the first time. Um, after you click on it, read through the remaining distractors and for each one of them say, would this make sense in this situation? And hopefully you should be able to find a reason why each one of those distractors does not make sense. You click on median nerve, you look at ulnar, and you can say, no, ulnar, you have ulnar claw, that doesn't make sense. And then that will give you the uh, confidence. If your answer is not there, this creates a little bit of panic. Take a deep breath, reread the stem, and see which of the answers that are listed make sense with the stem, and if possibly you overlooked or missed, on, missed something, which can happen in certain situations. Running out of time. It's um, a long test. Well, there's a lot of questions and you only have the 60 minutes to do it. So individuals will constantly say that I got to the end of the time and I still had five questions to go through. So have a plan going in, ration your time uh, productively. One of the pitfalls that students run into, um, and this depends on your sort of mindset. This is something I am very personally guilty of, and I see it in my middle child all the time too, is that I tend to, I know that there's a correct answer and I want to choose the correct answer. So I'll read a question. I'll look at the distractor list. I won't see what I think is a correct answer. And that bothers me. It's like, no, it's gotta be here. What the crap is going on? Why can't I get this? And you start to get frustrated with that amount of time of frustration that you're spending looking at the question in confusion is taking away from the rest of your test. So in that situation, if you generally cannot decide on a correct answer after looking at it for about a minute and 20 seconds and try and keep a general, you'll, you'll get pretty good at uh, timings on your head, make a note of the question number and go back to it. You may want to arbitrarily click on what you think might be the most logical question or answer or response so that at least you know you've clicked on it if you are running out of time so you don't have to go back to it. Um, but you know, generally speaking, you don't want to spend more than a minute and 20 seconds on each of these uh, questions. Um, Going along with that, you come across a question, you read, it's a short stem, you read it, it's like, it's gotta be this, you see it in the list, click and move on. The ones that you're like, I know this is 100% the correct answer. Don't waste more time than you need looking at it because that's now time that you can put in the bank for looking at the more challenging questions. <coughs> this is a huge one. Students changing answers. Don't change your answer ever because yes, sometimes you will change the correct answer when you had an error, but they have done extensive research on this and meta-analysis and what they have found is that when an individual goes back and changes an answer, 90% of the time they will change a correct answer to an incorrect answer. So if you look at that overall perception, though the, the odds are not in your favor here. There's a few reasons for this. When you go back at the end and you review a question, when you, when you read it for the first time, you are completely thoroughly involved in that question. You're giving it your complete mental focus. That is the only thing that you're focusing on at that point in time. When you go back, you're spending much less time on each question and you cannot give it the same amount of focus that you did the first time you read it. And so consequently, if you're going back and taking a look at it more in generalities, um, you might look at something and say, oh, actually, no, this, this is probably the correct answer. 
but you forgot certain details and certain nuances of the question from the first time that you read it. This is one of the hardest things for people to do, especially the people that love to take time at the end and go back. But I can tell you, and I'm gonna run some stats on this from what I was looking at. I was looking at the data coming in from the test and the people that submitted it the earliest, um, the average score was remarkably high, I was noticing. But then as more scores came in from individuals that were taking more time, that class average started to decrease, meaning that the fastest test takers tend to have the highest average score on the exam. What does this mean? Well, a couple of things. First of all, someone that is confident in their answers and is confident that they selected the answer the first time around, um, they're going to submit earlier and that confidence is probably a payoff. Individuals later on that are taking more time tend to take more time because it's taking them longer to think about each individual question because they are uncertain in that situation. But then there is also gonna be a collection of individuals that will go back over their test and relook at every single question and reevaluate and will make changes. And those changes tend to move them from having the correct answer to the incorrect answer. This doesn't mean that you should sprint through your test as quickly as possible because you're guaranteed to get a good grade. That's not the case. But the general strategy is when you answer a question using the strategy we just did and you feel confident that yes, I looked at everything else. This is the one thing that makes sense. Do not go back to that question again. That is done. You have completed it. You are not gonna look at it again. When you get to the end, as we talked about, you might have those frustrating questions that you just bah, could not come up with the correct answer. Once you've completed all of the questions, only go back to the ones that you tagged that you still do not have a certainty about. And those should be the only ones that you look at. Take a look at them again, but give it, hopefully if you've banked enough time at the end, the same amount of attention as the first time. We read it as if you're looking at the question for the very first time and approaching it for the very first time. And sometimes just doing this fresh approach, you will all of a sudden, oh, I completely missed that. How did I miss that point before? And the correct answer will um, come up to you. For those questions where it's still, you're just not sure, then it's recognizing, okay, I didn't study that material as much as I should have. Um, I will go with my gut instinct, uh, click on one. And then after you've gone through all those questions that you flagged, submit. Do not spend more time looking at all the responses, waiting for your time to run out, thinking, I've been given this time, I need to use all this time. Because uh, if you start doing that, you are gonna start second guessing yourself and you are going to start making changes that you're going to regret later on. Uh, just finishing up here with some generalities and then if uh, people have questions, I'm happy to address them. Uh, especially with anatomy, you're looking at a lot of structures in lab. One of the things is as you're looking at each structure to be able to do to yourself, this is just a little general strategy. Every time you identify a structure, say, how did I know that it was this structure? And a lot of that will be based on the things that are surrounding it, its association with other structures in the area, what it lies next to, using mnemonics, creating those things. Those are going to help you that when you're in the practical exam, and you see the structure tagged, you will be able to use that self-explanation that you used in lab, or this time you won't be able to use it out loud, but mentally you'll be able to think, oh, okay, this is this, I remember this concept, so this has to be the correct answer. With anatomy, drawing is huge. So quizzing yourself, but then also, um, if you're using those KLE exercises, being able to draw things out creates a conceptual spatial map in your um, mind that can help orient you 
in three-dimensional space. And the huge thing here is they do not have to be fancy. Stick figures are just as effective as trying to do a Da Vinci masterpiece. It's just making the interconnections in your head. Looking at things in different concepts. So, you know, for the shoulder joint, thinking about it on a skeleton, thinking about it through surface anatomy, working with other individuals, thinking about it in the cadaver, thinking about it in x-ray or MRI, looking at all of these different formats at the exact same time will help you with these structures to be able to associate them in all these different uh, formats and will help further reinforce your knowledge. X-rays can be a little bit foreign at first, but if you're studying them at the same time as you're studying the osteology, then you're going to be able to jump back from radiograph to osteology back and forth, and that's going to help to make stronger connections between um, the different formats. Application issues, practice, practice, practice. There are dozens of question banks out there. You'll find some now that you've seen the questions that I ask on examinations that will have similar sort of formats. Um, best study strategy that you can possibly implement, quizzing yourself, testing yourself, because the idea here is rather than just reading something and bringing it in, you need to do that at first. That's why I have you watch the um, lecture videos and look at the PowerPoints. But when you're being tested, it's not information coming in, it's information being pulled back out. And the best way to be able to pull that information out is through quizzing yourself where you're actively finding where it's stored. And the more times you answer questions and pull that information forward, the easier it becomes to find that information wherever it's locked in and to bring it forward. So quizzing yourself is absolutely key. Um, that is basically it for what I was going to present. Um, a bit to think about and it's being recorded. So um, you can go back to certain concepts, but hopefully there were certain things that we talked about that made sense to you. Um, at this point, we have a fairly small group tonight, but any questions that you that might have come up during the presentation or any questions in general, um, you know, you, you have a few minutes to uh, ask them. I had a question about one of the exam questions. Okay. So I think it was number one. It was about like um, the Q angle and like the injury associated with that. I believe it's like yeah, I've heard a few people ask me about that. So I'll take a look at the metrics on it. Um, the correct answer was the patellofemoral syndrome. And that was something that we directly talked about in one of the FAL sessions. Um, someone brought up a point that a previous class, a professor hammered that Q angle can also lead to ACL injury. Um, that's not something that I necessarily taught to or was familiar with myself, but we'll take a look and see how the metrics perform on that uh, test question. Yeah, that's what I was referring to. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. Um, in that case, um, hopefully you've done enough work today that you can enjoy your Friday night. Um, I'm going to join my, uh, join my crazy children in the other room that you probably could have heard in the background a little bit. Um, if there are any questions, I know some people always feel a little bit weird speaking up on these. Feel free to follow through with uh, email. Um, and otherwise, I will see most of you on Monday. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you.